I'd like to welcome Professor Kak Chen Chan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me to give this uh, short lecture. It is a very hard act to follow the previous uh, speaker. I think what I'm going to take you through is something perhaps not broad and doesn't involve the health of the major population, so to speak. What I'm going to take you through is an experience with the atrial septum and the atrial septal defect as a whole, and also in a setting when you have a younger person who has heart failure and you're trying to do something heroic, what do you do with them? I have no financial uh, benefits. I will not discuss non-FDA approved devices, but because I will be discussing the Amplatzer septal occluder, the only claim to fame I have is Professor Kurt Amplatz is a personal friend. In our medical school, in our education, we always see this uh, slide on the various form of atrial septal defect from the sinus venosus, the standard secundum, septum primum defect, and a fourth one that was not listed would be the coronary sinus uh, defect. But this is not the lecture that I'm going to take you through. What I'm going to take you through is why an ASD is important and how does it affect us in very quickly. It is a, usually about the third or fourth most common cardiac defect. And we learned over the years that if you do not treat an ASD, most of the ASD that are significant will give you trouble. Apart from hypertension, smoking and all that, this is the fourth most common cardiac defect that with the constant volume overload of the right ventricle will cause right ventricular dysfunction, atrial arrhythmias, and it is reputed that over time, the overcirculation in lungs will cause pulmonary hypertension. And unfortunately, as we grow older, we form blood clots. And if you have a communication between the atrial chambers, valsalva maneuver or by cho choice of flow, a blood clot may go the wrong way, and you may get, end up with a stroke. So the general teaching that we are all taught in medical school, in nursing school, in all the health-related school is, if it is significant, close the darn ASD. But if you look very carefully, is the ASD a really also simple defect? I'm trying to convince you that you can take a simple project and make it complicated. But the atrial septal defect is something dear to me, something personal, because as a young man in the late 80s, I was tasked by my boss, look, transcatheter closure of ASD is just about to start. We know the anatomy of ASDs, but we have no idea what the variation of a secundum ASD. He's a young man, soft it. So I was fortunate that in Edinburgh, we had two surgeons who were excellent artists and excellent descriptors. They are trained, obviously, in the old school. And going through the charts and not actually seeing the heart and looking at a description, I, with a stroke of lightning on my head, I'm usually not that smart. On that particular night, I realized that secundum ASDs are not all the same. You have secundum ASDs that we think we were taught right in the middle, but whoever is upstairs who designs ASDs are not so kind. There are some that goes towards the superior vena cava, some goes to the inferior vena cava, some are so big and some are really big, multi-fenestrator and partially fenestrator. And this paper actually put my so-called reputation on the mark in Europe. And based on this, there are more well-described true anatomic uh, variation of the secundum ASD that are available in the literature. But if you look at it, the ASD, although simple, is something very old. This case happened in September 2nd, my birthday, but I wasn't born in 1952. I was still half a DNA. I was swimming. This five-year-old girl 
was the very first patient that underwent successful open heart cardiac surgery by John Lewis in University of Minnesota. But more importantly, if you look at the people who assisted him, Richard Varco, but more importantly, Walter Lilihai. Lilihai is the first person who actually gave us the widespread use of cardiopulmonary bypass machine. Now, for those who really want to read the whole story, read the book called The King of Hearts. Go to Amazon, go to a bookshop. It's a fascinating book, it's a short book. It will tell you all the trials and tribulation of a brilliant cardiac surgeon. Then it is also something historical. For me as an interventional cardiologist, this guy, William Rushkin, notice that patients with transposition, 90% would be dead by one year if we do nothing. In those days, there's nothing we can do. Then he found out that those transpositions who have an ASD live longer. So he found out that if you use a Fogarty catheter, stick it in the groin, cross the atrial septum, and then yank it across, and since 1966, the mortality is the opposite. 90% will be alive by one year. But obviously, we still do this. We no longer wait that long. But the ASD is also vital. So if you look at transposition as we know, but then when you look at patients with small left, uh, right ventricle, small left ventricle, each of them have a completely atratic semilunar valve, and also in tricuspid atresia, in the absence of the ASD, this patient would not be alive. They would be dead. But we forget that some of the more complex hearts, we sort of skip our mind. But if you look at patients with totally anomalous palmy venous connection, all the venous blood coming back will have to come back to the right atrium. And the only way our left ventricle will receive blood is this atrial septal defect. And in the past, we were all focusing on whether there is obstruction or what. We forgot to look at the ASD, and we are losing a small proportion of our patients. So now I'm beginning to understand and respect the also simple defect. It is a defect that is somewhat paradoxical. If you think about it, the first man who taught us how to create an ASD transcatheter technique is still the first person to tell us you can close the darn hole I created transcatheter. So he created it, he asked us to close it. He's mad, but he's smart. So if you look at the original device that we used to close ASD, I'm not sure the light will permit you to see everything, but basically it's like a world's smallest and expensive umbrella with polyurethane foam, that's the attachment port. But at the edge, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six small fish hooks with a barb. So you open the umbrella on the left atrium. In those days, there are no echocardiogram, nothing. Hail Mary, you yank it, it sticks to the atrial septum. Can you imagine? It is one shot. It is like taking a parachute jump where your mother-in-law packs your parachute. <laughs> you pull the cord, you make sure it opens. My mother-in-law is excellent job. Then something current. Uh, unfortunately, in the United States, because of FDA regulation, the number of devices we have are fairly limited. I just came back from a conference in Taiwan. They got like a gazillion devices with gold-plated, platinum plate. You name it, they have it. Uh, but what we have today in the United States will be the original device that was uh, approved in the so-called modern era, the Amplatza septal occluder then followed about a year and a half to two later by the helix septal occluder pr produced by Gore Medical. Uh, the downside with the Gore Medical is that because it is soft, it, we cannot use it to close defects that are more than 15 millimeters in diameter. So the engineers went back and came up with a new reiteration of the Gore uh, sep uh, helix occluder is called the cardioform septal occluder, and this is what we use today. Now, believe you me, I'm not trying to boast, I came to the United States because of Kurt Amplatz giving me the chance to develop this device in the European and the British system, and my colleague in the cath lab with me, 
Dr. Larry Lutzen is one of the big gurus of the uh, Helix Apple of Pluto. So for once, in a center in the United States, you have one guru on this side and the other guru both competing with each other are both good friends. Rather than showing you a lot of data, I, I just want to show you the goodness of this defect. This is just pirated straight out from the uh, leaflet from AGA Medical or St. Jude. That when we look at the pilot trials that I contributed to as well, it's the surgical outcome and the device outcome are identical. So we are okay with that. But then the next thing we have to think to ourselves is are we doing the right thing to the patients? And the complication rates are nearly identical and both are equally safe. And in 1999, as again as a young man, I published the first uh, 100 case in England and we found the same results so that other smart people have followed suit. But there's no such thing as a free lunch. That's what they say. Because the Amplazza device is so widely used, it's a relatively stiff device. It has caused problems. <clears throat> In 2013, the FDA released a warning that when you put a device in somebody, you warn them that there is a 0.1 to 0.3 incidence of device erosion to the heart. And this is just one of the examples that I show you. And when we analyze all the erosion and we focus on appropriate size selection, I have never seen this occurring now, ever. But touch wood, I'm not, I don't claim I'm good, but I may be lucky that I've not had that occurring to me in my years of practice. So, the golden hour, as the sun starts to rise above the horizon. Again, Dania Beach, same place. I go there with my coffee in the morning, sit there and just watch. If it rains, I go home. So all of us have to report to a red national registry. So we have our very first harvest from Jody Maggio Children's Hospital, a running quarter. We did, in this reported running quarter a year, 27 cases of atrial, isolated atrial septal defect closure. Our cath lab, is a median size cath lab. Our HD distribution is the same as any North American distribution. So are we any good? All right. So let's look at atrial septal defect complications. Our adverse events are basically zero, except for this. I said, darn, what happened? So we look at the charts. We had apparently three deaths that were documented. Now, our definition of death is different from what you and I would define that. If I do a cardiac cath, I stick a cath in the arteries or veins, and three days later the patient gets knocked down by a car, it's a cardiac cath death. But when we look at this, three who died, there were three patients in ICU with, on life support, and they are waiting for more evidence to turn off the life support. So after cardiac cath, we found that it's an in untreatable condition, we switch off with the parents' permission, but it gets listed as my complication. Uh, the registry realized that they're going to change that in, in time to come. And when we look at the outcome of ASDs, obviously our outcomes are, are as good as any United States center. But more importantly, if you look at the uh, operating time and the amount of dose that we give the patient is certainly much lower than the average U.S. Uh, institution. It's not because we are good, because we have no trainees. So you have trainees, you, have to, you take your time, you've got to explain to them. And obviously there will be a few missed wrong steps. So we don't have that for now. I can't promise in the future. So, and now, if you would bear with me, I will take you through what a team effort should be. So this is our entire team. That's me, Lutzen, the surgical team on this side, Ed Bove, Richard Perryman, Steve, Frank Shaw that was here, I think, last year, and these are the cardiologists. So let me take you through this concept that 
I can make an ASD or atrial septum as complex as I want it to be, but I do not wish it on anyone else. So this unfortunate one-year-old boy came in, sick, in shock, with a chest x-ray that looks like that. Right. No question the patient has bad cardiac function. It's clear, right? If, even if you're not an echocardiographer, you will notice that this heart is just rocking, not contracting. So what we did then was we did the usual. We start all the inotropes. We start all the, the inodilators. We start all the diuretics. We waited. No recovery of left ventricle. So we say this patient probably will need a transplant, but needs a more secure line in. And guess what? Anything you do to a sick patient, it comes back to bite you. Patient arrest at the time of an induction of anesthesia to put a, a Broviac line. We resuscitated the kid, put the kid emergently on VA ECMO. Then what happened on VA ECMO is this. By six, three, four, five, six hours later, I can tell you the first word that comes to the mind of anyone who's dealing with this patient would either be related to some religious comment or person, bodily function, or the act of reproduction. It's bad. Yeah. So in <laughs> somebody agrees. It's either one of these three. But in any way, what we saw was the lungs were completely wiped out. The chest physio was saying, I'm sucking out tons and tons of blood. And we had flat line on our arterial line. And when did an echocardiogram, uh, the, the technician was saying, uh, your mitral valve is open all the time. It doesn't close. So we are in deep trouble. So what do we do? So we get a whole team together. So remember, this kid has no ASD. This kid has nothing except for a bad heart. So we got the whole team together, and then obviously our cardiac surgeons who are very familiar with bypass and the pump technician says, look guys, we are sucking the blood out of the venous side and pumping it onto the aorta. That's what we are doing. That's all we are doing. And because of that, because of that, and the left ventricle is not working, the, there is a lot of vasoconstriction, the arterial cannula is ejecting blood flow that the left ventricle cannot overcome. So the aortic valve remains shut. If the aortic valve is shut, nothing comes through, you get a flat line. So all the blood flow we saw on the arterial side is all from the uh, ECMO circuit. But unfortunately, the circuit is never complete. You always have bronchial blood flow and some pulmonary blood flow. And everything that comes back from the lungs had to go back to LA, it goes back to LV, it can go anywhere. So we are continually to feel the left ventricle. And you have continued increase in wall stress. So what did we do? So everyone sat in a room and then put their two cents together, he says. Okay, so the first thing we do is, why don't we create an ASD? I said, ah, I said, okay, that sounds like a good idea. Then what happens is when you create an ASD, you can suck everything out and then allow the left ventricle to decompress. I said, OK, I'll buy that. I'll do it. I'll get my name in fame. I said, but I have this problem. I have now a patient who's totally anticoagulated with heparin to the eyeballs. I have an atrial septum that is bulging, convex, towards the right atrium. So it is like hiring a hemophiliac to work in a razor blade factory. Right? It's dangerous. One shot, you miss it, that's it. So what we did was then we got the entire team together. We got the echocardiographer to do a transesophageal echocardiogram. You pass the tube carefully. Instead of using the standard transeptal puncture, we use an art radio frequency perforator. We got the cutting balloon ready and the static balloon. We cannot use the yank technique that I showed you earlier. So this is the transeptal puncture. What I want to highlight to you is in patients with this type of problem, you have this stiff so-called darning needle or, and you put it in the heart and you keep on pushing, pushing. And by the time it perforates through, you're outside the heart. Trust me. 
I've done that many times before. I learned from the mistake. So with this radio frequency, all you have to do is to touch it, tent it, and I'll tell you with the next slide. So what we did was under DEE, you make sure your needle is tenting the atrial septum, and make sure you're not near anywhere else. You tell the surgeon to get blood standby, everything ready, and just apply 10 watts of energy at two seconds. And immediately, it goes through the septum like a hot knife through butter. Then once you're through, you know, Bob's your uncle. So all, all we did then after that would be just inflate the balloon across the atrial septum and keep on inflating until the, ec the echo guy says, you have a confirmed atrial septal defect. And at the end of the day, this is what you see. An AS is created. We are sucking out the blood from LA to RA, and the heart is beginning to move a little bit. But I don't expect this heart to recover, but at least the wall stress is reduced. Headache over? Not yet. Not yet. The smart people in the team say, so if we look at it, what message are we going to tell people? Those who are old enough will remember this movie. ASD and ECMO, good, bad, and ugly. The good, it decompresses the left ventricle, it reduces wall stress. The bad, it artificially increases your mixed venous blood that we use in ICU to monitor oxygen delivery to the organ system. And ugly is you done well, get a full team together, and make sure your interventional cardiologist doesn't shake, and make sure you have the RF perforator. Then the next stage. We saw no recovery, so we decided to put the patient for transplant as status 1A. But leaving a patient on ECMO, the average wait time for a heart is, on, is about three months. You can't ECMO somebody on three months. They will stroke out like anything. So we decided to put the patient on an LVAD. And the only approved device in the United States for a child is the Berlin Heart. So this is the Berlin Heart. I'm not going to go into this detail, but the concept is like that. The concept is that we stick a big cannula in the left ventricle, suck everything out to the pump, and then pump it back to the aorta right, to maintain cardiac output. Simple. We forgot one thing. We now have an ASD that I created three days ago. So when you do that, you suck blue blood across. So that's a problem, right? Then the good, the bad, the ugly is this. An ASD and VAT, bad, real bad. It causes cyanosis because you are sucking all the blue blood across. You reduce pummy blood flow. If God forbid you suck across a blood clot and you pump it into the aorta, it goes up to the head, you get a stroke. And it defeats the purpose of having a VAT. It becomes ineffective. You're just recirculating blue blood. So the ugly is, they say, Chan, now you close it. <sighs> Man, what am I going to do? So we, we say, OK, I now have a device that I can use. Uh, but, oh, before I move on to this slide, this is Kurt Amplas' 88th birthday. He is holding, he purposefully bought this bottle of wine to serve us. If those have good eyesight, this is actually Palmas. The, the winery belongs to Palmas or Palmas shunt, uh, stand. They are good friends. So I said, OK, I can close the ASD, but this is normally how we close the ASD. You stick the groins, you put a catheter up, you put a device in. But here I have somebody with a chest open with ECMO cannulas and all that, you know, was trying to, you know, bloat it up with fluid. How the heck am I going to hit the femoral vessel? So the surgeon say, think. Let's think outside the box. He says, I got the chest open. I just stick it in. It's a walking on the wrong side of town. You know, and so that's what we did, put the device in, and Dr. Scholl, our surgeon, is an excellent artist, so this is what we did. So we sized the ASD by TEE. He did a sonotomy for VAT placement. The 
cannula was placed in the left ventricle, aorta. But before we turn on the pump, what he did was he puts his finger on the outside and sticks the atrial septum. And on echo, we had noticed the indentation. He said, oh, am I there yet? Am I there yet? You know, you travel with your kids in the back, going a long distance. <laughs> and he said, yep. So he knows exactly when you're directly across the ASD. And he puts a purse string and sticks the catheter delivery sheath right across. And in fact, closure of this ASD is about the easiest. So this is not movie pictures, and this is just shows the device across. And after that, the lungs cleared up, everything cleared up. You see this big stonking device there. Now, one word of caution. When we do this, we almost always oversize the device appropriate. Otherwise, it will not hold and you'll get sucked. And the downside is, I talked about erosion. So we monitor them very carefully for erosion of the torus aorticus. So today, this kid has a transplant and is well. All right? She's two, two and a half years old now and looking great. So what my message to you is this. The ASD is a very common defect causing right ventricular volume overload. We know that both surgery and I, we can close it, and the outcome is similar. And most ASD, obviously, if they are large, they are not favorable. But circumstances such as palmar atresia, tricuspid atresia, hypoplastic left heart needs an ASD. But when you come to patients that require artificial support, then you've got to think again. You want to put a patient on an ECMO, ASD is a friend you need to be able to create one. If you were to put a patient on that ASD, it's not your friend. You need to close it. And as a tribute to the entire team, this is not just me. This is all for the patient. And every one of those members of the team put their two cents into the box so we have enough thought process to allow us to think outside the box, respecting this also simple defect. And this is the real golden hour. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chan. That's an engaging presentation.